Now, our next speaker uh, is Mike Parfit. Uh, I've known Mike for, uh, I think, coming close to uh, 10 years. Uh, Mike is currently the Director of Medical Robotics at MDA, uh, MDA Robotics, uh, previously known as SPAR. Some of you know that better. Uh, Mike has had a very distinguished career at MDA and held many positions. Uh, but the role that I think uh, many uh, people have known him has been as the, the program director for the International Space Station Robotics, uh, covering both the Canadian Space Agency as well as NASA. Now, this is a very distinguished position, and he was very much involved in, in establishing the robotics in the Canadian Space Station and, and its, its current format. It's a multinational uh, partnership, but really uh, Canada has been a key partner with NASA in development of robotics. So as this title page suggests, what I'm just going to go through now is a number of slides that deal with how we went from outer space to inner space with robotics. So outer space means what Mahan just showed you, the space shuttle and the space station. Inner space means surgery. So starting with outer space, um, I'd just like to make the point that innovation takes many, many formats. A lot of it is obviously to do with technology, just as important as innovation in business and creating business. Um, safety, the safety of astronauts, the safety of people on Earth, and the safety of patients. And the ability to be very quick thinking and use very low technology uh, to get yourself out of trouble. And I'll show you some examples of that. And they happen to include such high-tech things as a fly swatter and a toilet. So you'll see what I mean by that in a minute. So this is the, the Canada arm in one of its usual uh, modes. It's, it's flown over a hundred times, which means it's obviously been launched and a hundred times, which is a, a major feat in itself. Um, what's it, so what was so clever about the Canada arm, bearing in mind we designed it in 1975? So the two things that made the Canada arm what it is, the two most important things, we had to design a control system with all the algorithms to control six degrees of freedom on an arm that was going to be 50 feet long and position it to want within one-eighth of an inch. And to be able to capture things, the arm itself weighed nine, 900 pounds. We were capturing things that weighed 65,000 pounds. Uh, just for information, that's at the size of a Toronto bus. And midway through its life, the Canada arm, without any physical upgrade apart from some electronics, was actually upgraded to be able to capture the actual space shuttle itself and attached to the space station. So what you're seeing here um, is the, is the um, Canada arm repairing the Hubble telescope. So the telescope has been put down in the base of the space shuttle. It's been captured by the, the arm in space. It's being located here. Here's a typical situation. The astronaut has now gone onto the arm itself and the, the, uh, they're going to begin a maintenance process that took several days. So this telescope was launched in about 20 years ago with a five-year life. It's still working, and it's got another 10 years of life, basically because we were able to maintain it and repair it through robotics and the astronauts. So in a sense, that's a good business, a good business, um, a good business thing for NASA in that they've never had to replace it. That the information it's bringing back right now, following its latest um, upgrade, is way better than it was 20 years ago, so it's a great success. From a Canadian perspective, from a business point of view, we had worked with NASA on the Apollo programs and the Mercury programs for many years. When they announced the space, station, uh, the space shuttle in 1973, 74, um, we knew they wanted to have a robotic arm. We knew they planned to give it to another company. So we went to NASA in an unsolicited way and put together a proposal. We brought some money to the table, and we were able to bring a business deal that meant we received that work uh, with an investment made by, by Canada. 
uh, but it's, it's paid for itself 20 or 30 times over. So from a business point of view, I, I think that was a, a good piece of innovative business development. So what's so special about the, um, the Canada Arm from a technology point of view? The control systems I mentioned, the second piece that gives it the real accuracy uh, are what's known as planetary gearboxes. So planetary gearboxes have been used by lots of companies in jet engines and, and gas turbine engines and so on. But we had the problem that our planetary gearbox is a series of 11 planets in our, in our case rotating around a sun gear. And the, the loads from all this, which are extensive, are being carried on a carrier. We couldn't afford the luxury of a carrier because of, because of the launch constraints. So we basically had to design the most accurate gears ever made in the world. Uh, we had to map every tooth of every gear. And then we would take a, a set of 11 mappings from planet gears and match it with a sun gear, put it in a computer program, which bearing in mind in 1974 was pretty high tech. And we had to, we had to show that that was the perfect match. We weren't allowed any lubrication. Uh, we cheated a bit by using dry lube, but we could not use wet lube. And so those two things together, the control system and the gearboxes, were really the key to the technical success of the Canada. So let's move on to a couple of examples of um, things that can go wrong. So on the left-hand side there is a great picture, but that's a disaster waiting to happen. That spacecraft there has just been pushed out of the space shuttle with, by a spring. What is supposed to happen is once it's cleared the space shuttle, it's supposed to start spinning. The motion of, the motion of launching it will have triggered a switch, an external switch. So there's three disasters waiting to happen here. We have a spacecraft fully loaded with fuel. It's flying side by side to the space shuttle. It's not spinning. We don't know what it's going to do. We don't know what the failure is. Um, it could re-enter the Earth's atmosphere if we don't do something within a matter of days or weeks. We have no idea where it's going to go. A significant part of that spacecraft would survive re-entry and it could hit a city, it could hit a nuclear power plant, it could do all kinds of things. And from a business point of view, the owners of this spacecraft have a $400 million loss on their hands, which in 1977 dollars is well over a billion dollars these days. So um, this is a good example of how quick thinking and, inno and low-tech innovation work for us. The spacecraft owner was given two hours to diagnose what he thought the problem was. He came back and said, I think the problem is the, there's a switch right in here that's failed to deploy. And so we had people in mission control and we sat down with them, with the astronauts, talking to them in space and said, how, how are we going to fix this? So in the 80s, if you remember those big thick books with the external blue binders, those horrible blue things, we worked it out with the astronauts, and obviously we couldn't get up there to do it. Pull out two of these, tear them apart, make two fly swatters. So we, 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 did, it, we did it on Earth, and we, we taught them how to do it in space. We created two fly swatters made out of these, uh, these binders and, and some plastic. We attached it to the end of the arm. The arm was... Then the, the space shuttle had pulled away by this time. It was too dangerous to, to fly side by side. So they, they, they went straight back in. They got to within about a foot of that spacecraft, which is a very dangerous thing to do. And we pulled the switch, and it started spinning. So that's a, you know, that's a, no, that's a lose, lose, lose situation. But within less than a day, probably 50 bucks worth of scrap paper that's, that's a piece of innovation in our mind. So the second piece of innovation is to do with toilets. So in the early days of the space shuttle, the, one of the big problems, and it was probably their biggest problem, um, was actually the toilet didn't work. So in space, flushing toilets, you can't have those because you can't have water flying everywhere. So it was basically a vacuum system 
superior to what you see on an aircraft where it's, you know, it kind of sucks everything down.